Uh, greetings. Good morning. Hope you guys had a great weekend. Enjoyed the 60 degree weather yesterday and the 30 degree weather today. A uh, couple announcements, big announcements here. Test is a week from today. Uh, if you look at the syllabus originally scheduled for today, I alluded to it last week a little bit. But the test has been moved to uh, next Monday, February 11th will be test day. So you, it's an extra week with the test. And hopefully we can get back on track here before too long. Chapter 19 will conclude uh, by Wednesday of this week, and I'll get into Chapter 20. Uh, chapter 19 reaction quiz is posted. I want to put a special note there out there on Chapter 19 reaction quiz. Uh, several of your works, though they would be anonymously selected, um, and your name crossed out, may be uh, used for a uh, some validation things with the University or uh, Missouri Western University. So make sure you do that uh, effectively. Uh, a couple things about the reaction quiz this week of note. It look, you're looking at Wilson's 14 points and the Treaty of Versailles. The Treaty of Versailles itself is 200 some pages long. You only have a handful of pages I'm asking you to read through and summarize or look at some things. So make sure you follow the directions on this week's reaction quiz. Uh, I will post a chapter 19 regular quiz tomorrow. Um, and we should be getting close to getting back on track. Next week I will be gone for the whole week, so all my lectures will be online. Even for those in my classroom, I will post them for you to, to listen to. I will get them done, hopefully by the end of the week. All that being said, um, we are now in World War I, and I'd like to uh, get uh, as much done today. We'll probably do the war at home, and then we'll get who is an American covered a little bit. Um, and then we can wrap up chapter 19 tomorrow fully far as uh, notes are concerned. Okay, so the Progressives War. Um, saw the war as an offering to disseminate progressive values around the globe, heighten the appeal in the United States. Um, obviously, progressive movement had been moving. We talked about the changes. One thing about it, uh, some of the progressive movement items will be put on hold until after World War I. Primarily, uh, women's suffrage uh, will be uh, put on hold. Um, one of the a couple of the other ones that we passed during the war will be, um, or right before the war, will be the income tax and direct election of senators. So there'll be some progressive movements in the United States, uh, but they are not going to be necessarily super, super uh, heavy uh, progressive around the United States during the war, because obviously the, most of the war support is going to focus on that. Uh, so there'll be rallies of support for Wilson. The wartime state, uh, they will create what's called the Selective Service. The Selective Service still exists to this day, and boys. I mean, I think soon to be women in the near future, you, at the age of 18, you have to register for the selective service. Uh, I did not, well, I guess I technically did, but I enlisted before I was 18, so I never had to directly register at the selective service. I could not be drafted uh, because I enlisted into the military. You guys, when you turn 18, or if you're already 18, you probably need to get registered with them, and then that just, all that says in the case of a draft, uh, you're registered for that. They'll create what's called the WIB board or War Industries board, basically just re uh, regulating um, um, consumer items that could be used for war, war items, war production. So it's basically centralizing all the war effort. Big thing that's going to kick, kick off just to make sure Americans support the war is the propaganda uh, war, propaganda machine. Just like the British had convinced us about how bad the, uh, the Germans were, Americans are going to be convinced that we need to stay in this war. Uh, CPI Committee on Public Information was created created to explain the world the world the cause that compelled America to take up arms and liberties and free institutions. Basically, this is kind of a progressive idea in spreading democracy. Uh, conscious appeal and progressive language of social cooperation and expanded democracy. In terms of freedom, democracy will be heavily used by the, the committee. One other thing to note, and I think I've alluded to this before, America is technically not a democracy. We have elements of a democracy, but we are inherently and truly a republic. So it's ironic that we keep using words such as democracy when we're not truly a democracy. But, in either case, we use this word. It's the sexy word. It's the buzz word. We keep using it. We even use it to this day. Coming to woman suffrage. Wilson had cautiously endorsed votes for women. Jeanette Rankin of Montana was the first member of Congress, a woman member of Congress, she will lose in 1918, voted against the war. She will also vote against the war in 1941. Um, was that after Pearl Harbor? Now? Yeah, she's the only person that voted against. She was a pacifist, and she inherently disliked war. 
So the irony of this whole thing is Jeanette Rankin, who is the first female elected to Congress, twice voted for against war. World War I, she's not the only one. But it makes sense in World War I. World War II, come on. We got our butts handed to us at Pearl Harbor. It was a premeditated attack, whether, and you can get into the conspiracy theories about World War II, and we'll talk about that later. Not necessarily conspiracy theories, but World War II in general. Now, Japan had, was, had every intention to attack the United States. They were going to try to wipe us out, kill as many Americans, etc., right? So she takes a pretty bad rap in World War II, and I think rightfully so. Uh, but anyway, either case, Jeanette Rankin is the first female woman in Congress. National Women's Party pressed for the right to vote with uh, militant tactics. Many older suffrage advocates found scandalous, uh, college educated. Uh, basically, the old suffragettes did not want to militarize or get very super radical with the right to vote. Ultimately, it'll take till after the war with the 19th Amendment, 1920, to get women the right to vote. Uh, so the war, they would have probably, if the war hadn't happened, this would have been sooner. But because of the war, it's probably delayed by a year or two for women's suffrage. But one of the biggest things was Wilson supported it, helped to get crafted, and women's suffrage comes about. Now, of all things that happens during this, we talked about what's called the temperance movement before. Temperance movement means you limit your intake of alcohol, tobacco, vices, right? And if right now, if you're watching me, I mean, I've got. Coke, uh, coffee, honey roasted peanuts, and chips up here. So, I mean, my vices are pretty strong right now. Uh, but going into the war, you would think one of the things that you would probably want people to be able to do would be drink, right? You're in combat, stressful situations, alcohol sometimes. And I'm not saying it's right, but it's a way to alleviate pressure. No, they passed prohibition. And prohibition is one of the worst events in American history for our success rates concerned. It'll last about a decade. Um, employers had hoped it would create a more disciplined labor force. They hoped it would promote a moral, orderly city and society. They thought this was the cause of uh, family, marriage problems, etc. Women hoped it would protect wives and children from husbands who engaged in domestic violence. And thus the 18th Amendment, which is known as Prohibition, was a grandiose idea trying to make American society better. The reality, epic, utter disaster. We'll get to more on that later. But it lasts about a decade. And the thing about prohibition, uh, it's not successful. You have the rise of the speakeasies. You have the, uh, we had a speakeasy here in Rockport, you know, under Main Street, you've heard about the railroad car there under the library. They, these are, if Rockport has it, you can imagine what the city's had, right? So these speakeasies were bars where they were secretly hid. Um, obviously, police officers even went there and they were on the payrolls of these people because they wanted to drink. Um, so, pro prohibition is a huge product of the progressive movement, but it is a disaster. War at home number three, liberty and wartime. There'll be questions raised about balance between security and freedom. The war inaugurated the most intense uh, repression of civil liberties that the nation had ever known, at least since 1798. You had the Alien and Sedition Acts. Uh, of 19, or 1798 under President Adams who are considered some of the worst and most intrusive rights uh, or reduction of rights ever and they expired. Basically they will be brought back in a different form. Government enacted laws uh, basically to restrict freedom of speech for the first time since 1798. Basically what we're doing is we're looking for spies. Of America's heavily uh, German ancestry there was concern there might be German spies. The Espionage Act of 1917 prohibited not only spying and interfering with the draft, but also false statements that might halter any military process or success. So essentially, if you speak out against the government, against, against the military, you can be arrested. Sedition Act made it a crime to basically speak or print materials intended to disrupt the form of government. If you advocated anything against the government, you could be arrested. Very, very loose wordage here, so you could say, well, the government sucks. And you could be arrested um, and put in jail. Eugene v. Debs, the socialist leader we talked about who ran for president several times, was jailed, received 900,000 votes for president in 1920 while he was in jail. 
President Harding will release him in 1921 um, in the right move. So you can see there's a repression or recession of rights. This often goes hand in hand with uh, massive events in American history. This is a pretty massive uh, event. War at home number four, slide. Coercive patriotism. 33 states outlawed the possession and display of red or black flag symbols of respectively of communism and anarchism. Any anarchical uh, symbols, uh, red and black flag specifically, uh, they were outlawed. 23 states outlawed a newly created defense, criminal uh, syndicalism, or the ad uh, uh, advocacy of unlawful acts to accomplish political change or a change in industrial ownership, meaning strikes, rebellions of any sort, they, oh, they might have been against the business. They're outlawed. So you can see here there's law and order must prevail. We cannot be anarchical. We cannot go against the government. America Protectively, APL, helped the Justice Department identify radicals and critics of the war by spying on their neighbors and carrying out slacker raids. The old lady watching you through her window. You know what I'm talking about. So then why was this all happening? Like, did we have a major, like, immigration of another... Couple things, Basin. couple things, and we haven't got quite to all of it yet, but I'll give you a, a little bit of headway what's going to happen. Let me finish this last part. Thousands of men will be stopped in the streets to show their draft cards, registration cards, etc. Couple things. So the war is kicked off, right? Right. So we get very restrictive support the war. In 1917, and I alluded to this a little bit. Um, and I probably didn't do a good enough job on this, but 1917, what happens in Russia? Something, was it with Lenin or something? Right, the rise of Vladimir Lenin. Remember, the Germans sent Lenin back, right? Yeah. The Civil War erupts, there's a revolution, Lenin seizes power. What happens to the monarchical family of Russia, the Romanov family? Boom, right? They're shot and killed. That's where the whole story of Anastasia, most likely, sorry ladies if you're watching, Anastasia probably died in the basement with the rest of the Romanov family. They're executed, right? They have family all across Europe because all the, the royal families are pretty much intermarried. That issue, that violence, the anarchal is a fear. The person who killed uh, Archduke Fa uh, Franz Ferdinand, the Austrian heir. He was technically, he was Serbian, but what kind of group was he part of? Anarchal. He was an anarchist, right? So an anarchist that started World War I. Right. Anarchy reigns in Russia. We fear it. We don't want it. And this, will, this also will carry over to the Red Scare that we'll get to post-war years. That's why we get really oppressive of rights, or basically clamped down during this period. We don't want it to come to the United States. And think about 1919, 1901, who had killed President McKinley, an anarchist, or a guy that was kind of upset about the world. So you kind of see our perception, anarchy, chaos, we don't, we're willing to give up some of our um, rights to stop that, or perceived as stopping it, I should say. So then why would a union, like strikes and unions be considered? Because strikes in a union... If you strike against the company, it shuts down, it disrupts the war effort, and this is during the war specifically, you're part of them. You're breaking up orderly conduct. You're breaking up the war effort. We could lose the war now because you are causing chaos. During time of war, they basically rank and file you, do what you're told. And if you violate that, you're part of the anarchist. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. That's a great question, Zach, there. Looking at why we repress rights during the war. Now, who is an American? This is a topic that comes up during the war in the 1920s. Obviously, at this point, we have one of the biggest problems in the country, and that is dealing with race. In 1911, the U.S. Immigration Commission listed no fewer than 45 immigrant races, ranged from Anglo-Saxons at the top all the way down to Hebrews, Northern Italians, and lowest of all, Southern Italians. Why Southern Italians 
or considered lower than northern Italians. I don't really remember. Uh, I think here it's because southern Italians were described as violent, undisciplined, and capable of assimilation, meaning they're proud of times. They don't want to change their ways. Uh, Hebrews is another word for what group of people? What's another name for Hebrews? You guys know it. Jews. Jews and Hebrews are the same. You're also going to have the rise of one of the crazier things in the history of the United States, the science of eugenics. If you don't know what eugenics is, that is basically genetic manipulation to create a superior race of beings. If it sounds familiar, Hitler practiced it. Oh, by the way, Hitler's not the only one that practiced it. And we just used it more colorfully, meaning, or more clean cut. Oh, you have a genetic disorder. We're going to make sure we try to limit the amount of basically crazy and mentally handicapped that are out there by either euthanasia, uh, um, uh, lobotomies, um, uh, tying tubes, you know, like stuff like that. We don't want, or we're going to build a save on asylums to keep Pete crazies away from the rest of society. So the science of genetics actually becomes a big thing in the, the early teens, and we often forget about it. Um, honestly, the African American community will be hit by it because women would often go on for routine operations and their tubes would be tied. Now, Americanization came during this period, the heightened awareness of ethnic and racial differences, process of making immigrants into what it meant to be an American, basically uniformity across the board, we all should be the same. Which, that process actually, think about today, we may have a lot of immigrants in the United States, but we all say the pledge, we all go through the same routine, like we have our inherited backgrounds, but at the end of the day, most of us have been integrated pretty heavily. Now, who is an American too? Naturally, during the war, it's going to be anti-German crusade, and this will happen during World War II as well. Germans bore the brunt of forced and Americanization. You need to assimilate or else. The first wave of Germans had arrived well before the Civil War. So many Germans had been here over 100 years. Not 100 years, but 60 years. My bad. I'm off a couple. In fact, I think my family came to the United States from Germany in the 1840s. So you're looking at 60, 70 years of many of these German families have been there. Maybe 50 on the lower end. So they're Americanized as it is, but the, the issue is a lot of them still spoke German. Nearly, um, by 1914, uh, German Americans numbered nearly 9 million. That's a pretty big number. But, um, by before the war, German was a popular foreign language in several traditions. Hamburger was replaced with Liberty Sandwich. I'm glad we brought hamburger back. I don't care to use the term Liberty Sandwich. Even the church I grew up in spoke German up to the 30s. Really, World War II is when they stopped speaking German there. But why do you think German, like now you understand why German is not a prominent even foreign language today in the United States. Most schools teach the more universal language of Spanish and French. German's harder to find. And that goes back to this deep root um, and this anti-German crusade. Uh, toward immigration restriction, the idea to restrict certain immigrants took a higher thought and basically became more prominent. Lewis Terman introduced the term IQ intelligence quotient in 1916 claiming to measure individuals' mental capacity. So the IQ test was born trying to restrict immigration. Army tests seemed to sh confirm scientifically that blacks and new immigrants were lower. Well, obviously some men are going to have lesser education and if you base it off an American education, what Americans at this point should know, it's going to be different because they're not as educated. This desire to upgrade society, involuntary sterilization, this all goes back into that form of eugenics I talked about. They are trying to, in their mind, create the best, the brightest, and the elites of a society. Now, moving on, who's an American three? We'll probably call this slide good for today, um, and then we'll move on and finish up tomorrow. 
Wartime demand for labor helped grow Hispanic population. Ironically enough, the one group today that often gets a lot of slight is the Hispanics. We welcomed them in free arm because we needed more labor. Um, but beyond the group that will not see increase is still the Asians. We hate Asians at this point heavily, even probably more so uh, than we do um, Germans. Mostly because, at least Germans, we can understand them, right? Anything Asian, Japanese, um, Chinese, language is pictograph, weird, speak funny, they all look the same. You know, we don't understand them, we don't want to, we don't want to know anymore. So it's a very racist viewpoint. Um, so we don't we don't um, engage in them. We actually restrict them. Obviously, the color line, black between white, African Americans were excluded from nearly every progressive definition of freedom. Uh, disenfranchised disenfranchisement in the South or the reduction of voting will be uh, uh, a huge few could very actually uh, can, uh, be part of the American dem democratic process or republic of um, voting running because they're going to be restricted through Jim Crow laws Ple uh, Plessy versus Ferguson which is uh, separate but equal barred from joining most unions and skilled employment little access to in industrial freedom many accepted segregation as natural and equitable um, and basically, they're not going to fight it. Roosevelt, Wilson, and race. Theodore Roosevelt invited Booker T. Washington to the White House, discharged 156 black sailors after a small group of black sailors just shot off their guns, killing one person. Essentially, they said, you shot the guns, uh, bullets into the air, the bullet came down and killed someone. Uh, point of this is, they, they used a, a little bit of a riot um, to basically uh, persecute a bunch of black sailors who really, really didn't do much of anything. Wilson imposed racial segregation in federal departments and dismissed numerous black federal employees. You're going to see a very stark line in the military at this point. Use whites and blacks don't mix in the military. Blacks will be segregated into their own units with white officers. They will allow D.W. Griffin's film Birth of a Nation to premiere at the White House. This movie is super, super racist. You heard the term blackface, uh, in which a white person paints themselves black or paints their face black to emulate a black person. Uh, this film has it in it. Very racist film. I watched parts of it when I was in college. They also portray African Americans as monkeys. Very stupid. Um, this movie was one of the original um, motion picture movies to be in Hollywood. And so you can see even in that movie a lot of the issues that are paramount in our culture. Today you watch it be appalled at some of the scenes. But the reality is, that's the way it was. Joplin, Missouri, 1906, three black men accused of rape were hanged from an electric light pole and bodies were burned. Were they guilty? Most likely not. But you can see race problems into the 20th century, into World War I, are not, are not being fixed. So who is an American is a very, very wide uh, definition um, in the early 20s. What I mean by wide is that's actually probably not real wide. It's like you cannot be a minority and be a true American. If you're a minority, you have to do what? Convert to this Americanization. Be the definition that is described here and that's the only way you're going to find uh, equality. Okay. We have a couple more slides of who is American and then we'll get into the last part which is 1919 and the, the end of World War I fully. So this is stuff that's happening as the war takes off and during the war years, right? So we have race issues. We have progressive movement issues. We have reduction of rights. So as the progressives had expanded rights, democratic elements, you're going to see a reduction in rights because of fears of the war. Okay? So now this is all creating an environment that we get into 1919, 1920 that's going to have dramatic effects um, in, on this country and the world. So. As a reminder, this week, Chapter 19 Reaction Quiz is up, posted. Uh, do not forget to do it. Be very thorough on it. You're reading the Treaty of Versailles and the 14 points, which we'll get to um, in 1919 with the effects of World War I. Um, chapter 19 Quiz will be posted probably tomorrow or Wednesday. You can take that. And then we'll get into Chapter 20 throughout the rest of the week, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Hopefully I can wrap that up. Test, week from today, next Monday, the study guide is posted on the classroom. If you have questions, please ask me, but the study guide is pretty straightforward. I will also probably uh, put a separate document with some of the multiple choice that will be on the test. All right? All right, have a great day, and make sure you're staying caught up.